everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise. I am one half the show. My name is Jeff. Joining me from a disclosed location this week, it is my co-host, Mark A. Johnston. Mark, how you doing? Yeah, I'm at the uh, Pacific Northwest Studios. I'm just dis- disclosing that. <laughs> Because last week you were at an undisclosed location. They, yeah. We still don't know why. But uh, they returned you, and uh, you're now disclosed. Trust me, it's, it's necessary. Uh, let's see. It's World Series week. Mark, the the, the playoffs are, uh-huh. are rounding down. I cannot wait for the World Series to be over because, frankly, the discourse on social media, like half of the people are excited for the Dodgers and and the Yankees, the two biggest teams and the two biggest markets to be facing each other. And then the other half is uh, very upset that we have to watch two large market teams that we see all the time because they're always on TV. It's um, well, you know, in all honesty, I believe this is the twelfth time that the Dodgers have played the Yankees in the World Series. But it's the I, it's the first time since like nineteen eighty one. Oh at, yeah, uh, right. I mean, it's been a long time. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. But yeah, I mean, I, we haven't seen yeah. anything like this in baseball. Really? No, no, no. It, it is the two biggest market teams. I know a lot of players and who they are and so on on each team because these guys are always on TV, like you said. I am got to pull for the West Coast and uh, pull for the Dodgers. I can't. I can't do it. I'm I'm going for the Yankees. <laughs> You're going for the Yankees. All right, Yankees fans who have complained about us being anti-Yankee, I want you to hear Jeff say this again. Jeff, who are you pulling for? I'm rooting for the Yankees. Is this going to pull us off all the Red Sox history podcast lists that we're on? <laughs> it might. It very well might. Yeah. Oh well, so Which, be it. <laughs> well, but, but Mark, we're a baseball history podcast, so we're not going to talk about the upcoming World Series. It'll at be least, history next week. Yeah, at least <laughs> at least not right now. We have a guest on today, so we want to get to that. And this is somebody. Well, it's not going to. You've read the title of the show. I'm sure when you clicked on this, Don August is back with us. We talked with him a couple of years ago, and he he talked about wanting to write a book about all his travels, and he finally did it, and for some reason wanted to come back and talk with us. So we had a good another conversation with him. It was kind of good because we got all of the the normal questions out of the way a, a year or two ago when we talked to him, and this time we could, we find out that he hit a batter on purpose one time. (laughs) <laughs> which yes. pitchers will never tell oh it slipped it got away from he, me he confessed yeah and mike mcfarlane was in on it because mike mcfarlane was his catcher some some good stories that we got out of don so stick around for that but let's get into our bp segment here first i want to jump out ahead of this right now mark in case you were not aware listeners each of these episodes is also posted on our youtube channel or if you're listening to it on the youtube channel you know what's up well I was working on some things that I'll tell you about here in a minute. And I saw that one of our videos got a copyright warning and I'm like, okay, I mean, we play audio from quite a few, you know, whenever we can find audio, we'll play it. I was not expecting to get a copyright warning from consummate foresight. That is with the letter four, just like, you know, I can only count to four consummate foresight and i'm like what's consummate foresight it sounds like some you know maybe they just own a bunch of rights or something i had no idea what it was and then i remembered it's that awful trevor bauer band (laughs) and we're getting nicked for that now i can guarantee you it's probably the first time anybody's played that music since it was released and they're like oh no no monetization from that that needs to be coming from us so if you need another reason to dislike Trevor Bauer. There you go. Trevor Bauer coming after us, you know? I know, right? I'm sure he was clicking around the internet. (laughs) I'm sure he was looking for for copyright infringements, and boom. He finally found one. That's it. Oh, and something new and hopefully exciting. I want to let everybody know we've got more ways you can watch us and more throughout the week rather than just listening to us uh, once a week. If you want to check out, if you haven't already, please do go check out our YouTube page and subscribe. So you will know because 
uh, I'm dropping new videos on there. We've got a new one up there that just posted the other day about Ellie De La Cruz that was a lot of fun to make. We've got coming up starting next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we are going to have a Guess That Classic baseball card feature, which uh, it's a YouTube short, so it's under a minute even. And three times a week, you can test your knowledge on classic baseball cards and myself and uh, Mark will be joining me every now and then. Next week, we're going to start streaming just for an hour or so in the morning on Twitch. Just doing some what I call baseball dailies. Uh, do the grid. There's a new game called MLB Walk Off. And just kind of look at some baseball stuff. Less than an hour. Just kind of catching up on baseball stuff. I'm sure we'll be talking World Series. That will be on our Twitch channel and then That'll also be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. Make sure to join all uh, those channels. Keep up with our social media. I'll keep stuff posted there and hopefully be something a little bit different and uh, see some more of you. All right. So let's talk NBA. You know I love basketball. Let's talk NBA. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's talk NBA. How about the, uh, the, uh, the Cavs this year? I think they're looking good in the Knicks. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but he's speaking. I do know, I do know the name LeBron James. I also know that he's got a son named Brawny. So they were in a, a regular season game together. They're both on the Lakers. I know that without having to look it up. And the wife and I went to trivia at a bar, and they had the Lakers game up there. And I had seen the story that the Griffies were going to be in attendance for this game because obviously the first father-son to play in a major league baseball game, and this is the first time it's happened in the NBA. So I knew it was going to happen, but they had the NBA game on, and I'm like, oh, good, something I don't have to pay attention to, and we can dominate at trivia. And I did happen to look up one time, and just as I did, they showed the Griffies sitting courtside. We, you know, I think we've talked about it quite a bit about them playing in the first game uh, together uh, on the same team. But nobody ever mentioned that Tim Raines and Tim Raines Jr. also did this. And nobody ever talks about that. You know, Tim Raines is in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But that I never mentioned it at all. But of course, they played together in Baltimore in 2001. Mark, it's that time of the year. It's Halloween coming up in just a couple of days and we do this for some of our major holidays we did miss arbor day but we'll make sure to get that next time around darn it we got some some baseball names related to the holiday so some halloween baseball names and uh, i've got a list here mark has created a list we don't know what's on each other's list let's see if we came up with any of the of the same things all right so i'll, I'll start off here I just started right off the bat with the green monster. Oh, that's nice. I didn't didn't come yeah, up with many things that weren't monster. players, but I thought the green monster definitely fit in. And we're a Boston Red Sox history right. podcast, so that, that fits in. Other one I came up, one of the, I always bring it up, that I got to meet and shake his hand and interview him, the incredible Harmon Killebrew, whose nickname was Killer. Yes, that I one. got that one. Got that one? All right. How about uh, this one? He was in the Wax Pack. Brad's first book was about the baseball cards. The Grave Digger, Richie Hebner. Yeah, I have Richie Hebner, too. All right. Why don't, why don't you hit me up with some of yours? Okay. I've got Dick Raditz, a.k.a. The Monster. Okay. I, I, know, a, the, I know the he's name. He's six foot five, 230, and they just called him The Monster. Mickey Mantle actually came up with the nickname. Okay. All right. How about Jim Coates? He was known for his quote unquote gloomy demeanor and they called him the mummy, which is <laughs> hilarious to me, <laughs> but I don't know why they called him the mummy other than he just had a uh, gloomy demeanor. When are mummies going to get their time? Like we've had zombies, vampires, werewolves, wizards. When yeah. are mummy mummies like peaked at Scooby-Doo and have been nowhere since. Well, those are the, the Brendan Fraser ones. Oh, oh, that's right. But is there really a mummy in those? Yeah, not so. Not the traditional time type. No, I mean, there's mm -hmm. Rachel Vice in it, which is enough. Well, that's enough to watch it, right? Yeah, there. but I, I, 
Well, and then Tom Cruise made one called The Mummy, but That's it wasn't. Right. I want like a bandaged mummy. I don't want yes. like these newfound mummies. I want like the, Evan Costello and The Curse of the Mummy. Exactly. When are they yes. going to have their time? Okay. Yeah. What well, the tangent? Okay, give me some more. Okay, this one I'm very proud of. Uh, Reggie Jackson. Mm. Mr. October. Mr. October. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I was I was very proud of that one. <laughs> and how about how about Mike Myers, aka Michael Myers? Yeah, I've got Mike Myers here, the pitcher. Yes, and I'm, we're speaking, of course, of the murderer in the Halloween movies, Michael Myers. Jason Worth. You know what his nickname is? I didn't, but I found out, and I wrote. Actually, there's two that are worthy here. I never heard of them. I can understand where one of them comes from. I think you're probably referring to werewolf. Werewolf. Yeah. Cause Jason he, Worth werewolf. Because he had the hair and the beard. Yes. Uh, but he's also nicknamed the DC Strangler. Did you see that one? I'd never heard that before. I have not heard of that. <laughs> I'm going to assume wow. it was from his time with the Nats, but that's a great nickname. I mean, it's not Absolutely. as good as the Stranton Strangler, but DC Strangler, that's uh, that's a good one. Absolutely. That's that's classic. How about, I got two names here that both had the same nickname, John Candelaria and Candy Maldonado. Oh, Candy. Very nice. I didn't even think of trick-or-treating. Yeah. I'm, I'm always thinking of trick-or-treating. I just I know it. you are. Uh, how about Brandon Spiderweb? <laughs> nice one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's see. How about, oh, we talked about him just, just earlier with Jimmy Fox. He was nicknamed the Beast. Ooh, okay. I didn't know that one. How about this one? This one I saw, and once I saw it, I'm like, oh, why did I not come up with that one? Vlad Guerrero. A.K.A. Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler. Wow. Yeah, it's some obvious ones. How about this one? This, uh, if you, when you listen to our interview with with Don, this is somebody he talks about. Danny Darwin, Doctor okay. Death. Doctor Death. I forgot about that. You're the one that told me that his nickname was Doctor Death. I remember telling you, but it <laughs> slipped my mind. I I should have thought of that one. Yeah. Or Steve Williams, also Doctor Death. If you want to go back to. Like AWA somewhere back then. Uh, let's see. Uh, you got a couple more? Bill Dickey. His nickname. Known for kind of like being a, aloof and, you know, kind of out there. A little bit like Ricky. Didn't really have, wasn't really close to any of his teammates, but knew them all. So he was known as the man nobody knew. Um, I also thought of uh, the Wolfman Dan Howley because the Wolfman howls. He was a catcher in 1918. Oh, it was no, kind of like a uh, Johan Santa and a uh, kind of thing that you did with Christmas. Santa, no. <laughs> no, I did that with Evilio uh, Hernandez, though. Evil Eo Hernandez. I don't. <laughs> okay, you're, you're, you're stretching now, is what it sounds okay. like. Okay, what about this one? This is my last one. Okay. Jack O'Laughlin. <laughs> That's kind of like we used to say that... Mike Kingery, if you said his name quickly and kind of mumbled it, it kind of sounded like Ken Griffey. Like, oh, yeah, I was traded for Mike Kingery. Kind of sounds like <laughs> Ken Griffey. Yes, but Jack think... O'Laughlin. <laughs> it's close to Jack O'Laughlin. Yes, fair. Well, it's in the it's in the arena. I'll give you that. Well, how about Jack Clark, a.k.a. Jack the Ripper? Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. Alvin Dark. I did not know that this was his nickname. Uh, probably better known as a, as a manager, the Swamp Fox. <laughs> I don't Isn't know. Is that how, a Disney movie? I, I don't know. I don't know how you get that nickname, the Swamp Fox. The Swamp Fox. Uh, do you remember Matt Harvey had one just spectacular year for the Mets and never anything else? In fact, I believe he, you. he pitched for the A's in the minors like two years ago. He's still kicking around. His nickname was when he was in New York was the Dark Knight of Gotham. Wow. Mm -hmm. And if we stick in New York, you can't forget Don Mattingly, a.k.a. the Hitman. Uh -huh, that's a good one, too. OK, OK. Now, I did find two names that I didn't know. They're not Halloweeny, but I have to mention them. First of all, Marco Estrada. I think was he I don't remember what position he played. 
but he was I, he was in the mid 2000s 2010s his last name is Estrada his nickname was Ponch okay Ponch I like it, it yes. you got to have some older guys on the team to come up with that and probably most of the rookies didn't understand it but then Spencer Strider current pitcher for Atlanta one of his nicknames is Art Vandelay wow he gets bonus points yeah <laughs> So, uh, Spencer Strider, good for you. Let's see, Mark, this show is going to debut on October 20th. A couple of things that happened, uh, we're going to go through these real quickly, but a couple of things that happened in baseball history today. First of all, in 1911, our boy Fred Merkel had a 10th inning sack fly that scored Larry Doyle to give the New York Giants a 4-3 win over the Philadelphia A's. That cut the A's lead in the series to 3-2, to two, but... Anytime you can get a Fred Merkel highlight that is not a boner, you're excited about that. Not too excited. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. 1978. Can you name me the, the first pitcher that won a Cy Young Award in both leagues? Um, nope. Nope. <laughs> Gaylord Perry did it. And uh, uh, sure. won the, the National League honor. With a 21 and 6 record and a 2.72 ERA for the Padres in 1978. And then, big, big day for us and this podcast happened in 1986. The New York Metropolitans rallied from three round from three runs down with two outs in the 10th inning against Boston to win 6-5 to five and push the World Series to Game 7. That, of course, happened when Mookie Wilson's Clutch slow roller. <laughs> Clutch slow roller uh, <laughs> went between his legs. But again, I you have to agree, it was going to be a base hit. No way he was. Buckner certainly wasn't going to get there. And Calvin Chiraldi did not field his position and would not have gotten to the base in time to beat Mookie Wilson. So it's kind of irrelevant that it went through his legs. I, I disagree. I think they'd have had him. Yeah. All right. Well, we can agree to disagree that you're right. (laughs) I think that works out, but uh, I think it's a double negative, which means never mind. I don't know. I don't do mathematics, but I mean, just a classic game. We talk about it every episode just about. So got that. And that's going to do it for our BP segment. So Mark, the ground screws out here doing the thing. They've got the red carpet that they roll out to the microphone when we've got a guest. We had uh, the privilege of having for the second time uh, on our show, a former major league pitcher. You probably know him with the Brewers more than anything. Don August. Don, thank you so much for coming back. I, I was a little bit worried about you wanting to come back on our show, but we really do appreciate having you uh, having you back. We had a great time last time. Yeah, that's right. I remember we had a good time talking and talked to some baseball. It was fun, and uh, thought we'd get back right here after a few years and just got some talk baseball and a little bit about the book. Yes, the book was something that you talked about last time you were here, and I'm looking at it here. Besides you, you've got like a, a like a, a pitching all-star roster here of other people involved in the book. You got Mark Knutson and, and Dan Plesak as well. I played a bit in this book. It's kind of a long story. It, it actually started nine years ago when I decided to start putting some stories down and stuff written down on paper and get on the computer and so on. But it really kind of started, I guess, my last year of professional baseball, I played in Italy and year 2000. And after that, you know, I was done playing and I just be hanging out with friends, neighbors, people I knew, and we might be watching a ball game or doing something outside, hanging out in the patio and, you know, stories start to pop up and, you know, something would remind me, Oh God, this remind me of a time I was in Taiwan or Mexico or the Dominican Republic or wherever. And so after so many times of doing that, my friends and neighbors are going, Todd, man, you got a lot of kind of cool stories. Why don't you write a book? And I said, well, I, I, I don't think I'm going to write a book. You know, I'm, never thought of myself as being an author or anything like that. And, and plus that takes a lot of time. And, and I didn't really think I had the, the mindset or energy to do it. I kind of heard it over and over. So by after really is after 15 years that I was out of baseball, I finally said, you know, maybe, maybe I will do something like this. Just kind of thought about things. And I contacted a guy who had written books before and kind of asked him if he'd be interested in doing it. And he said, yeah, he'd be interested so we kind of got into it. We just kind of talk on the phone maybe like once a week, and I'd just start 
telling them stuff about what had happened. And yeah, you know, but the story that I really wanted to write was about the crazy things that happen to you when you're in another country. So all those times I was in Taiwan and these goofy, weird things would pop up, you know, I go, that was, that's the stuff I wanted to really, I thought was the stuff people would really want to hear. I think a lot of people had already read enough baseball books about the history of the game, all the top players who've ever played, got their biographies. So my thought was nobody's ever really written or talked about what it's like for an American to go play in foreign countries. And I always felt of myself as kind of an adventurous kind of a guy. I was like, just let's see where this trail takes me and have some fun and, and go with it. So we, I had roughly a little over 800 total pages you know, on the Word documents. Then I talked to my former teammate, Mark Knudsen, who's actually the co-author of this book that we have. And he read everything. He read all 800 and something pages. And he came up with the idea here with, instead of writing the book chronologically, we're going to write it topically, by topics. He wrote these things down, and we went by the topics we used for the, the titles of these chapters were old rock and roll songs. You know, Mark Knudsen and I were roommates in the Astros organization. When I made my first year in AAA, he was a guy that was kind of up and down with the Astros at the time. And we became roommates on the road. And then eventually we were both traded in the same trade from the Astros to the Brewers. Back in 1986, we were traded for Danny Darwin. That's when the Astros won that Western division back in the day. And me and him went to the Brewers organization, and then we both were roommates there, and then we made it to the major leagues together with the Brewers. So we got a lot of good background. So we started talking, and he, he said he would do it. So the, and because of the, you know, our, both we both, like I said, rock and roll music. So like the, the first chapter is called Break On Through. That was a song by The Doors, which is my favorite all-time rock band. And it was kind of fitting because for that chapter, it, it kind of did the background. So we used some stuff for that first part, but the majority of the stuff came out of the second part. It was me, a little background, and me making it to the major leagues. Then the second chapter comes around, and we use the, the title, Who Stopped the Rain? And that topic kind of reveals a lot of things that revolved around weather, particularly raining. But then it also kind of shifted into, uh, I was... I was in a couple of typhoons while I was in Taiwan. So that kind of fits into the category. And I was also in a major earthquake in Taiwan. So that kind of fit into that topic there. We ended up having 12 chapters and then an epilogue. The epilogue is called with a little help from my friends. Talk about all the players that I had met and kind of became friends with as teammates in these foreign countries. And we just went through all these different chapters with using all these different um, rock titles. It took us probably another two plus years. So it ended up taking about nine years for us to get this thing finally, finally out for me. Wow. So, you know, we worked together and finally last uh, September 27th, it was released. But you, you bring up the, the, the music titles as the chapters. I don't think that you had walk up music when you were playing. I might be wrong. It might've started to come in there at the tail end. It sounds like you're a music fan. I got to ask then what, if you're coming out to start the game, what music do you want to, do you want played for you? Well, the, actually, the Brewers did have a, a walk-up song for me. So whenever I was in Milwaukee pitching, if I came in relief, that would come on. But I was majority-wise was a starting pitcher. So at the top of the first inning in there in Old County Stadium was break on through. So that was my, my lead-in to pitch in the first part of the game, the top of the first. So, that's again, that kind of fit in for our you know chapter one. Did they do that knowing that you were a Doors fan? My first year... I don't think they knew I was a Doors fan at that point, but my first year with the Brewers, I was doing pretty good. So people kind of started taking me a little serious. And then I forget who exactly, somebody up in the press box or whoever does that, they asked me one time. So it's toward the end of the season. I said about the last two months of the season, they asked me if, if there's a walk up song that I would like. Back in the day, the big song was for Teddy Higuera was La Bamba. I think right around <laughs> the big part of his career, that was a big movie at the time. Yeah. Uh, I then said, hey, I, I thought about it, thought about it. I, I said, break on through by the doors. And that's how that became the case. <laughs> that's awesome. That's actually where Mark and I met it was in in-house production at the Seattle Mariners. Well, somebody else that has been with the Brewers since you were there is Bob Uecker. Do you have do you have any good Uke stories? Um, 
a few, I guess. Nothing really spectacular. I can kind of briefly tell you the one that I liked. Before I was a brewer, a bunch of the Brewers players, they were staying in, it took place in Detroit, and they're staying in downtown Detroit. And a number of the other guys that were on the team, they went to some bar down there in Detroit and stayed there pretty late. They had a pretty good time. And there's no cars in downtown. You know, during the day, it's got a bumper to bumper and a lot of traffic and stuff. But it was, it was nobody on the street, like a ghost street. So uh, they were no, they didn't have a car, but they were in no shape to drive. And, and I guess this place wasn't really that far away from the team hotel. So for a reason, Bob Bunker took the lead of these guys and, and got them to get into a single file. And they started marching down this empty downtown street of Detroit on their own to a, like a military cadence. And as they're going down the street, they're making right turns and lefts and there are no cars really around. Maybe a car might've passed by, but a car did come and it was a police car. <laughs> and the, police car the policeman's going, okay, well, what is this? It's obviously some people have been out probably doing a little drinking or something and uh, wondering what this is all about. Then as he kind of sits there for a second, he kind of realizes uh, it's Bob Euchre leading this gang. And uh, so he starts uh, asking them questions like, well, what are you guys doing and stuff like that? And, you know, and Bob Euchre, I guess, in a drill sergeant kind of replies, you know, it's like, we are on the way to the hotels. And the policeman, I guess he drove slowly right by them as they continued the march then. And and then I guess when he got him, he felt like the like police officer got the guy safely to the hotel. I mean, I went on a few occasions, you know, we'd gone out, a group of guys ended up with Euchre and, we go to these places, and the thing about Euchre is he was so famous. He was the rock star. He was more famous than Yount and Mulder or any of the guys on the team. People would just go crazy over him. And when we would go out to a place, it didn't take long at all that people would recognize him, and just people would just mob him and surround him. It's kind of nice at first, but sometimes it gets to be a little too much. And I remember so many times we'd just be there barely 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe have a drink or two, and, he would have to leave and jump in a cab and go to the next place. It wouldn't take that long again. And off we had to take off because it just got to be a little overwhelming at times. Don, last time we spoke, we heard a lot of your stories about some of the road trips uh, when you were in other countries. I still, I, I remember you talking about bus trips where you had to turn the lights off so nobody would come and shoot at the bus or try and rob the bus, that kind of stuff. What about, minor league travel here when you were in the United States. What was the roughest road trip you had to take when you were here in the minors in, in this country? Well, fortunately, the road trips here in the States weren't hardly as bad as some of them I spoke to you earlier about. In Mexico, we, a short road trip had been like 12 hours. We had 14 hours, 16, 20-something hours, even some 30-something hours trips. You know, and as you Started when I first started to play professional baseball in the minor leagues, you always heard, oh, the minors, man, those long bus rides and stuff like that. I think the one I remember was we were playing uh, a night game in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we had a day game the next day in Memphis, Tennessee, which was about a 12-hour bus ride. Got done with the game as a night game, probably a 7 or 7.30 start, done by about 10, 10.30 or so, then packing a bus up, getting something to eat, and all this, so we got a late start getting out of Charlotte, roughly, I'd say probably midnight, I'd say. So we we were on a bus the whole night, you know, got your pillows and you're laying against the, you know, the side of the, inside of the bus and and people lay on the floors, you know, that whole thing. I was, in, that was a double A team for the Astro. I was the new guy, I was the youngest guy. So I, I got, you know, we, we the, all the guys selected their seats. So I had to go in the very back where the where the bus engine was. And we nicknamed the the bus was called the Iron Lung, as we as we affectionately called it. So I had to sit back there where it was just steaming hot. I, I often I was the guy who had my shirt peeled off and just sweating my butt off, lay, you know, up there against the the back. And we're traveling, and people are you know finding me asleep. And we literally just we didn't even go to our team hotel. We went from the bus right on in to the parking lot of the stadium there in Memphis. Got all our dirty uniforms back out and our gear. We walk in. We literally just changed our clothes, had just enough time to like play, catch, stretch a little bit, and the game started. So that was kind of the tough one. I thought I didn't pitch, but I remember saying, God, I'm sure glad that was my day to pitch. <laughs> Maybe we we're just kind of out of our minds, but we kicked the the crap out of that Memphis team. We, we, we I don't know, it could have been something like a, a 12 or 14 
to wow. one or nothing. You know, we, we, we destroyed them. So maybe we were just so deliriously tired that we just played out of our minds. But that was a kind of a, a tough one there. I'm sure those buses probably weren't what we think of like buses that you take long trips on today now either. Yeah, it wasn't quite a coach bus, but just below. It wasn't a, probably between a school bus and probably a coach. The buses that I rode in in Mexico, you know, I was on two different teams when I played down there. And the one bus we had had air conditioning, but it didn't have a bathroom. So on those super long bus rides, the bus driver would pull off the side of a highway and that was your chance to go to the bathroom. Number one and number two, by the way. You got 30 guys just filing out to go find a bush. bush, People are driving by and they just see a whole team of guys there just taking care of themselves. (laughs) Then the the second team I played on was kind of the opposite. They had no air conditioning. So when it's hot, when you're driving through the Mexican desert, pulling your windows open, just having hot air blowing in on you. But we had a bathroom. But then in the book I described, I didn't know all the bathroom rules when I first joined the team if you're allowed to do a number two in the bus or not. And I had to learn the hard way that I was, I didn't follow their, their protocol. Things that I guess people don't realize they hear bus rides, but you know, those bus rides in Mexico could be tough. And the first team I played on, we were like almost in the middle of the country. So they're still pretty long, but not as bad. But the second team I played on was down in the Yucatan. And we had to make those long bus rides up to Laredo and Monterey and stuff. So, I mean, those were like 30 something hour bus rides. Jeez. Now me and a few of the other when I joined that team, I didn't know this. If the bus ride was super long, we could fly on our own. And <laughs> the team would reimburse us. So I, I definitely would not go on those 30-something-hour bus rides. I would fly. But there was times, though, you don't want to be that American guy, you know. Oh, the American, the arrogant American, or the pampered American guy. So I, when there was like a 14-hour bus ride that was coming up after I flew, I would suck up the 14-hour bus ride, even 16 maybe. And to show the, my Mexican teammates that, hey, you know, I'm not this arrogant guy. I'll, I'll hump this long one with you, too. But I wasn't dumb enough to do the 32 hour. <laughs> I, would, I wasn't going to go that far. So during that time was kind of the heyday, though, of major motion pictures that focused on baseball. And the two, mm-hmm. two that I'm thinking of is, is Major League and Bull Durham. Yeah. Did you ever have what? I, I don't know if they happen or not. Did you ever have a mound meeting? where I, you don't have to be talking about, you know, sacrificing a live chicken and candlesticks make a nice wedding gift. But what's the what's the weirdest thing that's been discussed on a mound visit while you were there? A um, little bit of everything. It could be, I, I, you know, I, I talk to kids and teams and stuff like that. And, you know, I talk about when the player, you know, he's kind of getting racked up a little bit and the relief pitcher's getting ready. They'll call down to the bullpen and the, the reliever's not quite ready. You know, I need eight more pitches or something like that. So the, the coach does a little flip of his fingers like this and tells the catcher to go talk to the pitcher. Now everybody knows he's coming out. So a lot of discussions about a lot, a lot of different topics. You know, Hey, did you go to that? Uh, did you end up going to that barbecue restaurant there around the block from the hotel there in Kansas city? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, but people are thinking you're strategizing. Now you touched a little bit on uh, playing in one of my favorite foreign countries, a uh, very dangerous place with a lot of strange people. I'm talking about Los Angeles. Oh yeah. And well, uh, in Los Angeles, so yeah, <laughs> that Olympic team. That, there's some pretty doggone good players on that team. Uh, was I don't want to say exhibition sport, but it was a non-medal sport. Is that right? It was, it was called a demonstration sport, but okay. we didn't play for medals. It um, didn't go the official medal count. Okay, we had a regular old tournament, and baseball. You know, since then has grown a lot, but at that point, you know, there was baseball. There was, a, there was like a team USA always. And they go around, they played around these different countries and played in these different tournaments. But uh, the American Baseball Federation was really trying to make this even more international and get into the Olympics. The host country is a lot, you know, the ones that pick the, the sports that are going to be played and then they can pick a couple demonstrations. So it's great for America to push our pastime, our great game, to get them into the Olympics. So that 1984 Olympics was a, a demonstration to, you know, showcase what they could do. And it was a success. You know, we, the, the games were held in Dodger stadium. They're all pretty much sellouts, which was probably around 50 to 55,000 people. It was a good tournament. We didn't win it. We, you know, we were expected to win it, but on any given day, if I, you know, I, when I retell that story, we lost to Japan and we had played them on a, on our tour. We played a 30 something day, 30 something game tour prior. And we had a seven game series against them where we beat them six out of seven games handily. 
But they ended up winning it all. They beat us on that day. They outplayed us that day. Then I forget what year they they took it out. So they're going to be back in um in Los Angeles again in 2028. But I did just I got contacted not that long ago, maybe a couple months ago, saying, "Hey, uh, how about doing a reunion? I, I called you guys how many years ago, but I think this would be a really good idea because the '84 Olympics were in Los Angeles. The 28 are going to be back in Los Angeles. Maybe bring us back and." do some kind of a reunion and be part of the Olympic thing. You guys were on that iconic 85 top set with the yeah. team USA. And I remember I had a bunch of your cards. You were kind of looking out of the dugout pensively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had the, uh, your Chapman college stats on the back. Right. That's good stuff, man. Those cards are iconic. Yeah. Great oh, stuff, they man. They really were something when they first came out. Now, not all of the players on our team got the card. Was it 15 of us? Cause we all went on, especially after the Olympics were done. We had five guys who were still going back to college. I still get them sent to me in the mail, and I sign them and return them and stuff like that. So good memories and kind of a neat overall thing, yeah. That's awesome. Is that your favorite baseball card with with of, of yourself? I think so. You know, I, I, I end up getting a number of uh, baseball cards. They end up having, like, a bunch of different companies, you know, Fleer and Tops is still in there and Donruss and – there's some more, and there's local kind of cards people would make up. So over my time, I, I have I got a bunch of cards, and I like them. I think this one has more of a maybe a little sentimental because it was the first one, and it was kind of different, and still is probably my favorite. I don't know how much of a memorabilia guy you are, but what do you have anything that, one, do you collect memorabilia, and two, do you have the Holy Grail, your favorite piece of memorabilia, and what is it? Well, I'd say... The biggest things I have is my Olympic medal, my Olympic baseball uniform. That's probably the big ones. I got um, my time with the Brewers. We had two different uniforms. We had the the pullovers and the pants with no belt. Then after my second year, my third year, we, then we had the button-ups with the belt. So I home and away uniform. So I got jerseys for the home and away for those two different uniforms, my game jerseys that I actually wore. I'm not really a memorabilia type of a guy. My son is a big time baseball fan. So as a little kid, he got into collecting baseball cards and getting autographs and collecting pictures and getting all kinds of stuff like that. So you mentioned the Sansa belt pants and uh, that's one of the things that we joke about a lot here. So this, yeah. I had this question and, and you mentioning that brings that to mind. What is one thing about major league baseball today that you wish would have been in place when you were pitching things like the pitch clock, pitch calm, the lack of sans belt pants, which we've decided to call sans sans belt pants. But it, what would you like? What's something from the game today that you wish was part of the game when when you were playing? Mm, tell you the truth, I don't like a lot how the, the changes have occurred. For me, I was a quick worker, anyways, on the mound. I, I wouldn't have needed a pitch clock. That pitch clock would not have bothered me. I was just kind of faster. I got the ball back, sign or two, boom, and let's go. To me, I was getting a little ridiculous. That guy, every pitch, the guy would step out. He'd readjust his gloves, his batting gloves, and his shirt, or this or that. And it was the hitters really taking the time. So that rule, if that was a problem, I think that would be a good – if I was pitching today, I think that would be a good rule I, I would have liked. I didn't like that Major League Baseball had to make a rule about the shift. I wish – the teams would have just taken care of itself, just exploit it. You know, we would have just bunted the ball or just peppered the ball to the, that left side all day long then. There's no more bunting. There's hardly any stealing and that sort of stuff. Moving guys over. It was like launch angle, and everybody's got to hit a home run. You know, and it was yeah. the game, just nothing but power pitchers. You know, everybody had to throw in the mid-90s to 100-something miles an hour, or else you probably couldn't make the major leagues on the most part. But the, my day, I, I, I was like, I liked how everything was going back then. Maybe I'm old fashioned in my way is the old good way, I guess. You know, I don't want to sound like an old guy, but maybe. <laughs> so, so listeners would, would not think this is a two-strike noise podcast if I weren't to ask a, a former player, especially a former pitcher, a question about Ricky Henderson. Now, Ricky did all pretty good about you, uh, against you. He hit 375. Uh, you walked him a couple of times. With him on base, if the rule, if you were facing with the rules that are there today, where you can only throw over twice and right. you've got the bigger bases, what does that look like in your mind? But throwing over only two times, if we had, if I could tweak the rule, maybe you know to save time, uh, maybe three times. I don't think people would abuse that rule, anyways. If you walked him on, if you got his hit, well, then he earned his way out. But if you walked him, then you, you know you kind of created your own problem because you know, he was ready to go. He's looking to steal. 
you knew it, he knew it, he knew you knew it, and all that kind of stuff. And when you came second, you looked over, man, he had a humongous lead. And I go, geez, I, I should be able to just be able to pick him off. I get my good move. I should get him. But no, man, he knew. He just can read a pitcher, knew if you're going to go home or not immediately. If, if you're coming over, he was already diving back and beating. And you're like, how the hell, how can he get back when he's got that big of a lead? And, you, you know, you changed your time up. Now we got a clock that kind of hinders that. And if you threw your second time, he knows now you can't throw another time. So that would have been really hard if we had these rules against them that they now have with Ricky Henderson on base. But I kind of was smart enough because I watched and I maybe got some reports on this, is you have to be careful that when he's still second base and you get all dejected because you did all the moves, you stepped off and you, you throw over 100 times and, and he's still still the base. And it was like they would forget about him on that next pitch. So a lot of times he's still second, and he'd be looking for that next pitch again, the second pitch there, to try to steal third, catch you off guard. So I always made sure I gave that little extra look and kept him. He'd jump back a little bit. So I don't recall him ever stealing third off of me, but I'm sure he's still second at least a couple times or so for sure. Uh, Don, we're talking about the way the game has changed in the last 40 years. And why do you think that the complete game is a thing of the past? I mean, your rookie season, you threw six complete games. You would never see that right now. No, I threw six complete games. And I wasn't there for a full season either. Right. I, I got there in the early June and stuff, especially now in, in playoff baseball, about how they don't use starting pitchers. You know, during this whole season, it's this scary number 100 pitch. I mean, I threw over 100 pitches a bunch of times. We're grown men. We're professional athletes. We're in the prime of our life physically. We can throw over 100 pitches. And then what gets to me is, you know, the complete game is pretty much gone. Because, oh, my God. Because then they put in the third time through the lineup. You know, then they're going to get you. Yeah. There's some – the analytics of that stuff is – so I I hated that. 100 pitches and you're done. Third time through your lineup, you're done. Yeah. Uh, I I remember one time uh, Trebleborn. Tom Trouble and our manager of the Brewers, I had a shutout going. Getting a shutout was a big deal back then. We didn't keep track of pitch counts, but we didn't use them as, as crazy as they use them today. I remember I went into the ninth inning with, like, I already had like 100, maybe 25 pitches already after eight innings. Trouble, you go out there, that's your game to throw a shutout in. Here's the ball, Don, go nine, win it. Yeah, you know, if you struggle a little bit, things happen. That's what relief was for. But now they over-specialize every little thing, yeah. you know, taking the pitch out early. Then they bring in a, a relief pitcher. He goes three up, three down with three strikeouts and just has the nastiest stuff. But oh, that's it. We got to bring in the seventh or eighth inning guy now, and, and it's the same thing. You know, I have in mind of a, a guy like Chuck Krim, who was a reliever back in my day, the kind of the bridge guy to police act at times, is he would have an outstanding inning, and Troublehorn left him in to pitch the ninth inning. He could have easily brought police act in to get the easy save then or whatever. But, you know, that's just kind of how – the pitching staff was used, you know. I wouldn't like being a starting pitcher in today's baseball. If I were to be a pitcher, I'd want to be a reliever because you pitch all the time. You're pitching in all the mm. key situations. I It used to be that the, the starting pitcher was the main guys. They were your best pitchers. Gotcha. Don, did you ever get ejected? Um, never professionally. I got ejected from a game only one time. It was in a college summer baseball league in Alaska, of all places. <laughs> Can you tell us about it? Sure. I did throw at him. That the was going to be my question. Was. Was. <laughs> I get in trouble now. But I got kicked out of the game already. That was like over 40-something years ago. Uh, I was playing in, I was called the Cook and Lit Bucks, my team, and we played in Anchorage, and we shared the same stadium as the Anchorage Glacier Pilots. So we were <laughs> Great both names. Playing, kind of right through the city, tense and, tense and all that kind of stuff. I got hit a home run. And I think they drilled the next guy. Or I forget, maybe the guy who hit the home run, his next time up, he got drilled. Something like that. And there's some stuff that kind of happened. So that one of the guys who got hit was our was our catcher, Mike McFarland. He ended up playing Major League Baseball, too, as a sure, catcher yeah. with the Kansas City Royals for a little while. But anyways, we, we both looked at each other, okay, something's going to have to go down. So we looked at the lineup. Who's going to be coming up? It's like the third or fourth inning or something like that. And... The first batter became like, oh, man, that he's a nice guy. I, I don't want to drill him. But the next guy was a, a jerk. He was a, a guy that it was easy for people to not like him. He was a good ball player, I'll say that. But he was just a guy that just a big mouth, talking crap all the time. Just You just looked at him, you just didn't like him. We go, oh, we both, okay, second batter, that's our guy. So the first batter, I think I get out. Beforehand, I told my cat, you know, I told Mike McFarland, I said, hey, if I miss him, let's go right back and get him again. 
So he was a left-handed hitter, and he was standing way off the plate. So I had to really throw it inside. <laughs> so I threw it way inside, and he sucked his stomach in, and I missed him. But we already planned. We already said, hey, if I missed him, do it again. Next pitch, I got him square. And uh, the ball went right to the ground, right in front of him. So it was like, thud, boom, boom. Well, he, he picked up the ball and ran at me and fired it at me, <laughs> right back at me. So I reflexed and deflected it. And after I did that, we both just saw each other and we just we just charged each other. We fell to the ground. And once you fall on the ground, everyone jumps on top of you. It's like you know a dog pile, and you're like at the bottom, and you can't. You literally you can't move. Your arms all stuck, and you're you can't move a bit. The newscasters, you know, the news people were there with their cameras. That you know, gave the highlights, and here's a big highlight, of course. And so I remember watching the brawl afterwards. It, it got to be up, up, up above me. It got pretty nasty. There's some big time punches being thrown. People were getting. You can hear the thuds of getting people getting slugged and people were flying and throwing around and <laughs> that whole thing. So after that all got done, the umpires talked to each other and they said, Don, you're out of here. All right, I was out of the game. Then a funny part of that story was uh, during the day, uh, you know, we had we had jobs. You know, they got us jobs to make money during the summer. We're college guys. And uh, my, I had an easy job. I, I stayed with a really wealthy family and I, I had to paint their house for the summer. And I had a roommate, and uh, we had another guy on the team did that. So they, they had this three-wheeler motorcycle they had you know, in the garage. So we'd paint for a while, then they had this big open field way behind the house. So we'd race these three-wheelers around, and I crashed, and I gashed my pitching arm open. But I didn't tell the, I didn't tell the manager. So I went to our trainer, and she says, okay, I'll just wrap it up, and we'll, we'll worry about it later. So I went out and pitched with this. I had my arm wrapped in a big old gash of my right above my elbow. So – was great for me because I, I was a poor college starving college kid, you know. I, how am I how am I gonna go pay to get stitches? So I said, hey, in the fight, somebody spike kicked me. So the manager and the general manager they took me to the hospital. After I got kicked out of the game, I went to the hospital and I got stitches put on on the team since they got in a fight there. So I kind of got lucky that way somehow. Did the media? Awesome. Did the media? Uh, the, the people that were there ask you after the game, "Did you do it on purpose?" And you said, "Oh no, it got away from me both times." Oh god! <laughs> I don't remember how I answered that. You know, my memory is I don't think they asked me. I don't recall if they asked me or not. Well, all right. My my final question for you is: Which player got under your skin in the major leagues? What was that one guy that you you just? Oh, I don't. I don't like to, not just he hit you yeah. or whatever, but just like, I hate playing against this guy because he just bugs me. Hmm. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm guessing if there's I, not I, one I, off the top of your head, maybe nobody did. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking if there's somebody that really rubbed me wrong, I, I think I would have just still would remember it. If someone's going to get under my skin that bad. Since I don't quite recall, maybe I don't, I don't really think there was anybody who was like that. Because I'm I'm looking at your your career versus other batters. Dave Henderson hit you really well. Harold Baines. Those are two of the nicest guys in baseball. So obviously yeah. I'm gonna guess they didn't get under your skin. I always when people were asking me the question, who are the most underrated players that you played against? I often talk about Dave Henderson. He was a very good player. You know, especially off of me too. But I think he's good against a lot of other guys all the same. But yeah, he was kind of a funny guy. You know, and I'd be at pitching, he's on second base, and I remember just smiling at you, and he's, he's just saying funny things at you. He wasn't being mean or nothing, but he, he was trying to distract you by being funny and goofy, whatever it was. So I always kind of liked him. I thought he was a, a good player and kind of a funny guy and be out there, you know, the Major League Baseball. Yeah, and do <laughs> uh, with that with that gap in his teeth and yeah, that big no smile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> number 42. <laughs> gap, you're like, oh, God, you're killing me. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Don, what do you say? Do you want to open up this pack of baseball cards? Let's look at a couple of, a couple yeah, of these guys. Was, we did that last time. We opened some, are these from the 80s? Yeah, no. so I've got, I've got a, well, 1990 is what I've okay. got here. All right, right in the middle of my career at the time. Yep, 1990 uh, Don Russ, so they're going to be really red. Okay. Well, I remember we did this last time. It was fun that we, if I remember the guy, if I did what I remembered doing against him or maybe a teammate or whatever. Yeah, this, this will be fun. I like this. Yeah. So we've, we've changed some of the rules since last time. We don't go through the whole pack because that's a, that's a long thing, but we mm -hmm. do have some rules here that we do. We take the baseball reference war of the player from, in this case, 1990, but then we, we add and subtract some things, what we call any eighties baseball aesthetics.
So that means if we can see that they're wearing real stirrups, that's a yeah. plus. If they've got flip down sunglasses or really yeah. just anything <laughs> on their face, like those big science, if they couldn't see without glasses, they used yeah. to you know, wear their glasses on the field, those kind of things. Big mustaches, which are kind of back in vogue now. But if there's anything like the two-in-one stirrups uh, that Kent Herbeck uh, you know, yeah. brought into the, <laughs> brought into the game. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I ended up wearing those in the big leagues. That was just nice. I had to put stirrups on and put your, you know, your tube sock on underneath that. It was just real quick and easy. One big thing, you threw them in the laundry and they came back. So I ended up doing that too. I, I like those painted on things. Yeah, it, it, it really is. So we add and subtract some of those things, or if there's any pop culture, they were on The Simpsons or Seinfeld, that kind of stuff. We give extra points for that. So right. let's take a look here. Your first card is the shortstop, and we only do five cards here just to okay. make it a little bit briefer. Your first is a shortstop for the Philadelphia Phillies. We love him because he always had a great jerry curl, Steve Jeltz. Yes, yep, yep. I remember him. Yeah, he's a good player. I think I played against him in the minor leagues. If I remember this story right, he was batting against me, and uh, I went to throw a curveball or a slider, and it slipped out of my hand, and he it was going at his head even. He put his hand up, and they hit him in the hand, and they had to take him out of the game. And I, oh, I felt bad about that. I go, I didn't throw at him. It was a curveball that slipped and got away. So I, 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 I didn't know what he thought about it. So the next day during batting practice, he was out shagging balls, and I remember walking out to him during their batting press. I said, hey, I went up to him and said, hey, are you okay? Just to let you know, I didn't do that on purpose. You know, that was a curveball that got away. So, yeah, he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know, I know. So we're all cool about that. So, But that's a story that I think I remember about him. Well, let's see. Overall, he played for eight years in the big league, seven with Philadelphia and three with Kansas City. In 1990, it was his final year in the big leagues. He only played in 74 games. This was for the Royals. So he played his entire career for Philly and then last year with the Royals. He only hit 155. Uh, no home runs, 10 RBI, one stolen base. So mm -hmm. I'm afraid this one's probably oh a minus point seven war. Uh, no, okay. for that okay. but you're gonna score big on some of the other things here right. he's got on this is not spring training either but he's got on a different <laughs> phillies uniform it's a pullover it's got his number on the shoulder it's purple but then they've got the powder blue pants on so sans about pants mind you so we're gonna give you a point for that uh, right. a tenth of a point he's got the mustache as always and the oh, yeah. jerry curl we have to give yeah. him a point for that he does have two and ones on though so overall that's going to be a minus point five for you there unfortunately oh, <laughs> you're gonna keep you out of the minors somehow but yeah <laughs> yeah let's see here uh i'm not sure that he was on any uh, tv shows but we'll take a look anyway because you never know so he was born in paris france Oh, really? And holds the record for most games played at bats run, a whole bunch of things, for players who were born in France, second in home runs behind Bruce Bochy. Yeah, as I said, it's great to that many guys from France who played in baseball. They, they don't even play baseball there. Yeah. I think this baseball is just in the Olympics. They didn't have it in there. So Military family. Oh, so that, yeah, that's I bet that. Yeah, but still, I mean, trying to find a place to play against – <laughs> they're French kids, I guess. <laughs> they don't have a lot of baseball fields just hanging out oh. there. No. They're, they're, all, they're all playing soccer, that's for sure. But, yeah, yeah he got his baseball in somehow, so that's a, a plus. All right. This next guy is one of our favorites. Here he is with the Yankees. Outfielder. We think of him with the Blue Jays. Jesse Barfield. Oh, yeah. Jesse Barfield. I remember that's how they announced his name in, uh, when I played against him in Toronto. Yeah, Did you play played. in the Sky Dome or Exhibition Stadium? I played in 1988, my first year. We played in Exhibition Stadium. In 1889, uh, yeah, I, got a, I think you might appreciate this story. They were supposed to have Sky Dome ready for the beginning of the year, and, they, and it wasn't ready in April. So they, they opened up in June, the first week of June. Well, the Brewers were in Sky Dome. Oh, really? We played the first game, and guess who was the – Who's starting day pitching that was? I'm going to guess it's you. Nice. I, I, I was the very first starting pitcher. I went up against Jimmy Key, and I got the first win out of Sky Dome. Nice. So, so that's a kind of a trivia thing that people often who know that kind of stuff will remind me. I, I had people from Toronto often send me the, the ticket stub and all these other different things to sign and give, you know, sign back from that day. You know, they, they kept my hat at Toronto. 
I signed it and they kept it. And when they do their, well, a lot of people who went to Toronto and they do the stadium tour, well, they had this one place or room or whatever where they had a lot of the artifacts of that game, you know, someone's bat. So I was the first winning pitcher. But then to, to be humble, then I said, yeah, I did give up the very first home run to Fred McGriff. So I gave it up to a good guy, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and Paul Molitor got the first base hit. I think it might have been a double on top of that, but I forget exactly. It could have been a single. But he you, got the. Uh, just looking up here, you against Jesse Barfield, he only hit 222 against you. Two hits on nine, uh, nine at bats, one home run, though. Oh, okay. But uh, Jesse Barfield in 1990, he played for 12 years, nine with Toronto and then four with the Yankees. 1990 with the Yankees, he hit 246. 25 home runs, 78 RBI, and that is a war of 5.2, which is, that's great. Let's see here. Uh, he's got a mustache, as he always did. That's yeah. the only did thing. Did he have a Jerry Curl, too? Uh, yeah, he did, but uh, I can't yeah. see it here. It's not very long, because he's with the Yankees, oh, so he had to keep the real hair. long, but I remember when he was with Toronto, but that's a Yankee photo, I guess, is kind of there, but... I remember it, it laid down to his shoulder. Maybe the Yankees had to kind of trim it up a little bit. Yep. Get rid of those sideburns, too. That's uh... yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you're at 4.8. That was a good one for you. Oh, yeah. well, we've got to check. I, I I know Jesse does a lot on uh, on Twitter, but I don't know that he's got a lot of pop culture. I don't recall him being on any movies or TV shows or nothing. Nope. Nothing there. All right. So your next card. Uh, is a pitcher for the Reds, Ron Robinson. Oh, well, okay. Ron Robinson became a teammate. Yeah, that's a 1990 car, so it's probably got his 1989 stats on it. In 1990, we traded for him in July, like right before or after the All-Star break. We made a trade and got him in, and he pitched great for us for the rest of the season. And a funny story about Ron is he had a really bad elbow. You know, I mean, his, his, if his left arm went straight down, his right arm was like at an angle, bent. He couldn't straighten out his arm all the way. And he pitched that way. And he had, before he warm up, he has taken all these like Tylenol pills and this sort of stuff. And he had wrapped it all wrapped up in heat, just get it nice and hot so he can loosen up and throw. And like I said, he pitched really good. I think he was like maybe 12 and three or something like that to finish out the season for us. 12 and five, yep. Yeah, that was the last year of his, his country. So he signed a, a three year deal with us back in the day. He got a three year, $3 million contract. He was never able to play. <laughs> after that, I think he pitched. If you had his stats there, you'd look how many more games did he pitched after the nine, 1990 season. Nine probably, games. Nine think, games in two years, yep. Yeah, so, but he was a great guy. I liked him a lot. So he was traded. Bob Sur- Sebra also came yep. over, and uh, the Brewers sent Billy Bates and Glenn Braggs to Cincinnati, yep. who then yep, yep. unfortunately went on to win a World Series against uh, the A's. We <laughs> It always comes up. But let's see, in 1990, uh, as you said, split time between Cincinnati and Milwaukee. Overall, he went 14-7 and seven with a 3.26 ERA, 179 and two-thirds innings pitch, 194 hits, 71 strikeouts. And that is good for a war of a positive 3.2. You're killing it here. All right, there we go. Nothing on this card. It's just a headshot from, from spring training. So nothing that's going to help you out there. Yeah, no stirrups or anything. I'm trying to, I, I bet you he, well, he came from Cincinnati where they wore, I think it was mandatory they had to wear stirrups back in. For the, the, the only good thing Marge Shot ever did right there is yeah. making him wear stirrups. Yeah. So he probably wore stirrups with us, but you just can't see it. Well, he married his high school sweetheart, Becky Robinson, and have three kids. That's, that's all go. I know about. All right. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Here he is with the Blue Jays. He was on the 86 Mets, by the way. Had a kind of a famous hit in the World Series. Mookie Wilson. Oh yeah, Mookie. I pitched against him. I got I got in trouble once, not in bad trouble, because we were not supposed to throw an outside pitch to him because he had hit it the other way. <laughs> so um, I just got called back up. I got sent down for a couple weeks, and I got called back up, and I had to work in the bullpen a little bit. Then I got my start to get back into it. And it was against the Blue Jays. All game, I kept pitching him inside, inside. Did fine. Late in the game, I go, I got, I got to go outside one time. You know, you can't just only be in. I threw the one outside fastball, and he hit the base hit between third and short. Pitch, after I came in that inning, our pitching coach just got all over me. Didn't we tell you not to throw it outside to him? I go, yeah, but, you know, by the 15th pitch, you got to throw, you know, you got to show it. So, but I remember now, he was a, 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 a good base runner, too. 
Oh yeah, a lot of lot of lot of stolen bases as well. Overall, twelve years in the big leagues, ten with the Mets, and then the final three with Toronto. Hit two sixty five, a three hundred on base though, three home runs, fifty one RBI, twenty three stolen bases, and a one point nine uh, WAR. That's really nice. Neat. That's nice. Now, looking at his uh, card here, he has real stirrups on. He has got a, a mustache. He is wearing a batting helmet with no ear flaps, which we consider 80s baseball aesthetics. aesthetics. And he's not wearing any batting gloves. So, oh, yeah. There we go. You're going to get hurt into his hands. That was all he needed. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, uh, he, he wasn't on Seinfeld, but he is mentioned. Is he? Because, well, yes, because Elaine goes, yeah, Mookie was there. He's the one that got that hit, and I'm always upset by that because it wasn't a hit. It was a slow roller, okay? <laughs> it was not a hit. I'm well, just saying. Good news, yeah. for, good news for you, Don, is that any Seinfeld reference is a whole extra point of war because we're huge oh, Seinfeld fans. Heck, yeah, that's a classic for sure right there. Good. So uh, that's a big score for you there let's see what if there's anything else here pop culture wise uh, besides being in the 86 oh we've talked about this he's got uh, he and his family sing gospel and have a couple of cds out so oh, wow. we're going to give you that be then again or you know it's some something pretty big he's also uh also is uh, has a catering business now he caters the mets fantasy camp as, as well as other things but i right. i know that he does that all right. Yeah. All right. So you're at 11.8, your final card. This is a really good score for five cards, by the way. Maybe top 10, I hope, of all time. Yeah, well, we've kind of started over since we've adopted these new rules. But this is a good card. Boy, this guy is just huge. And we know he's got pop culture points coming up. Catcher for the Angels, Lance Parrish. Yeah. Yep. He was with the Phillies for a number of years. Last thing I remember I did with him in 1992, I went to spring training with the San Francisco Giants. Now, before spring training happened, I was told I was going to be going for the fifth starting spot or the long relief role. And maybe a week or two before spring training started, the, the Giants traded all-star Kevin Mitchell to the Mariners for three major league pitchers, you know, Mike Jackson, Dave Burba, and Billy Swift. So that kind of hurt me. <laughs> now I've had these guys to compete with. And they were going to send me down to minor league camp the day that I was scheduled to pitch in a game against the California Angels. I said, well, I'm supposed to pitch today. They go, do you still want to pitch? I said, heck yeah, I do. So I thought if I did good, I might change their mind. So I did. I pitched my two innings against the Angels. I had six up, six down, two strikeouts. One of the strikeouts was against uh, Parrish. Mm-hmm. I, I got ahead of the count on him and um, – I threw a high fastball and he chased it and swung and missed and I struck him out. So then I go into the dugout, done pitching my two innings, and I'm waiting for someone to come talk to me, say, hey, good job, or you're done, or this, that. Not one coach came up to me. So I walked in and cleared my locker out and had to go to minor league camp. I remember pitching against Parrish and a uh, big, strong guy, you know, very good hitter. And uh, But I struck him out, so that's that's something I remember about him. Yeah, big guy, 6'3", 210. I mean, he is hulking in this picture. Yeah. The Big Wheel yeah. was his nickname. And uh, let's see here. Overall, 19 years in the big leagues. Wow. Behind yeah. the plate, 10 with right. the Tigers, oh. 4 with the Angels, 2 with the Phillies, and then Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Seattle, and Toronto for parts of seasons. In 1990, good news for you, he was an all-star, which you get extra yeah. points for. Hit 268, 24 home runs, 70 RBI. Had two stolen bases. That's impressive. And uh, overall, that is a war of 4.5. Wow. Right. Which is great. Now, looking at this card, he's got real stirrups on. He's got a mustache. Yeah. So that's going to be an extra two-tenths of a point. But this is a just a great card. It's in it's in the big A. Chili Davis is on deck, stretching behind him. That's just a great card. We have had Parrish here a couple of times, so we know that he has been on a couple of TV shows. Okay. Uh, let's see. Even though it doesn't, wow, it doesn't even mention it here. I'm going to have to edit his Wikipedia page because he appeared in an episode of Different Strokes and hmm. the Jeffersons. Yes. Wow. Okay. And I, I don't remember that, but that's, <laughs> I'm all for that. That's the stuff that we <laughs> that somehow well, we know all head. about. <laughs> now I want someday if you pull my baseball card out, talking to who a guest you have on. I've been on TV. All right, let's hear it. Not in America, though, in Taiwan. Uh-huh. I made a couple, two, maybe three appearances. They used to have 
big time at the time in the 90s in Taiwan was variety shows. You know, of course, all in Chinese and stuff like that. But I was brought on a few times to make appearances coming from the Chinese Professional Baseball League and the Taiwan Major League in my uniform. One of the things I had to do is they played a game where the, the stars of the show and, you know, they'd have like their famous movie stars and singers and actors, actresses, all that on there. But what I had to do with one of my teammates is we'd have headphones on and there's a Chinese song being said, but no one else can hear it because we're the only ones that could hear it. And then me and my teammate, another American, since we didn't speak or understand Chinese really, we had to like mimic what we were hearing. And then they had the stars had to figure out what song I was actually singing. And then uh, they would buzz in trying to guess what the song was. But my teammate was Ron Jones. He played the, uh, with the Phillies briefly in his you know, on his career. He went first and he sounded horrible. He's like all nasally and trying to he's squinting his eyes. He's trying to repeat what he's thinking he's hearing and, and no one could figure it out. And they're like, buzzing and just making jokes about it. What I went on was my turn now to make a fool of myself. I'm trying to do the same thing. And I started to learn to speak a little Chinese and I felt very awkward up there. So I said, well, she Sun Jin bean, which means I'm feeling crazy being out there. So uh, get out. But as soon as I said that, the, all the buzzers went off and they got the guy and he guessed it right. I went, holy crap. So after my turn was done, it was Ron's turn again. So I was sitting next to probably, I don't know, uh, one of the people at the TV station there filming this. And I said, how did they guess my name? How did they guess my thing? They go, because you said, you said Sun Jin Bean, and that's, that was one of the words that was actually in it, which I didn't hear it. And it was a popular song at that time, so they all pressed their buttons and guessed it right. So I, I guess I ended up winning the contest in that way. But so I did like dim. So, well, I'm <laughs> to explain it. Anyone who ever gets my card, I want to have some bonus points. We will write that down. And if you can <laughs> get, find us video of that, that would be even better. Cause <laughs> yeah, I wish I had that. I, I watched it when they, cause they taped it. I remember watching it when they played it, but that was back in the days of VCR tapes and you know, and um, I didn't have it recorded. I will make a note of that. Well, this is, I mean, for five cards, you had 17.5, which that right. is what nobody else has double digits. So, I mean, you are so far in the lead right now. And I had a minus card too, didn't I? Oh yeah, your you your first oh, yeah, card, I, I, the the Steve Jeltz card. Or no, yeah, I lost a yeah point seven or whatever it was. Or yeah, you that was like a half a point you missed off of Steve Jeltz, even with that great all of his aesthetics going on there. So that is an incredible score. All right, good. I, I don't know what it really gets you other than bragging rights, but congratulations. Right. <laughs> Well, Don, thank you again for coming back and, and talking with us some more. Do you want to tell everybody the best way that they can get the book? Yeah. First of all, the book is titled Pitching to the Corners, My Post-MLB Career Abroad. It's it's published by McFarland and Company. So you can go on their website and order it that way, and they mail it to you. A lot of people I know are going through Amazon, which is kind of the same thing. Get on Amazon, put my name in, or the title, Pitch Into the Corners, and you can order it there and they'll deliver it right to your door. It's the book is, like I said earlier, not about being in America. You know, it's really about American pitcher playing in different countries around the world. You're dealing with culture, you know, with food and language. And, you know, as a foreign player, you're always expected to be super good all the time. They give you no room for error. It's like, man, quickly they'll let you go. But it tells about all these kind of crazy stories about what, Happened to me there, so pitch into the corners. Look it up, order it, and I hope you all enjoy it. Awesome. We'll put all of those, all of that in the show notes as well, so people can just click on it as well. And uh, good luck with the book, and thank you so much for joining us again. It was it was a blast. Thank you. Yeah, it was great being back. I, I had a great time the first time a few years ago. I had a great time doing all this this time again, so maybe again in the future, look me up and see if I can break my record. But, there you go. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right, so as I said, check the show notes. You can find uh, the locations that you can just click on there to uh, be able to get Don's book. Uh, it's really cool because uh, a lot of the stories that he hinted at and gave us little pieces of both in the last time and this time are in that book, so be sure to pick that up. That's going to do it for this episode of Two Strike Noise. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows you can find more of us all over the internet. All you have to do is uh, Google Two Strike Noise. That is TWO Strike Noise. You'll find us on all the social medias, including our YouTube page. And make sure to go check that out and subscribe. We 
put a new video up there this week about uh, Ellie De La Cruz, which uh, was fun to work on. Starting next week, we have got a new feature three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On YouTube, we will be posting a uh, classic baseball card that you're going to have to guess who it is. They're YouTube shorts. It's not going to take a whole lot of time. They're like 40 seconds each, three times a week. See if you can beat the timer because they are timed because we have to make everything a game. And also, Mark, starting next week, I and you might be able to join me sometimes. I'm going to be streaming maybe a couple of times a week on Twitch just for about an hour in the morning. I've got some baseball dailies to do things like the grid. There's a new game called Walk Off which uh, is in the same ilk of the grid, but kind of completely different. And uh, just kind of look at some things for, you know, just 45 minutes to an hour, a couple times a week, just to keep everybody updated. And that will be on Twitch, and then they will be posted on YouTube. We also, Mark, though, have uh, yet another way to get a hold of us, is what you're telling me? Yeah, it's one of them electronic mail addresses, email. You could get a hold of us at 2 strike noise. spell it out, T-W-O, strike noise at gmail.com. Nice. Again, thank you very much for joining us again, Don August, and that's going to do it for this week. We'll see you next week on the next episode of Two Strike Noise. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day.